we are recording. So uh, please, whenever you're ready, Nick, uh, take it away. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Yeah, um, well, and I, I guess I'll go ahead and get started if that's, if that's okay. We're two minutes ahead. Ah, yes, we can. Um, we can wait one more minute if folks are perhaps jumping from uh, another presentation. <laughs> Although I would, would be happy to take the extra minute. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah, if you'd like to take the extra minute, uh, we can get started because it is being recorded. Go ahead. Okay, sounds good. Uh, well, as as uh, introduced, uh, I'm Nick Smith, and I'll be talking about how we've approached uh, our data analysis task with uh, the ecosystem that you are all familiar with. And we, I mean, very many people, like too many to put on this slide, so. Um, let's get started. What is, I'm just going to give like a brief domain overview, um, try to make it interesting and not too technical. Um, uh, kind of a detailed overview of exactly how we do our data processing, you know, the full data processing. And then I'll narrow in on the, the analysis step, which is sort of this last step where uh, scientific Python tools such as, uh, you know, um, like the Dask ecosystem starts to become applicable. And then I'll dive into like specifically how we adapted scientific Python to make it usable for our data and how we scale it with Dask. And then, then finally give an outlook on what we think we could improve with our, with our system. And I hope people sort of take away, you know, from this uh, uh, things that may be familiar in their, in their uh, problem domain that they might be able to lift and or collaborate with. Okay, so if I want to describe particle physics in three steps, um, I'll try to do that. Step one, you smash particles together. So as uh, mentioned, I work on CMS, which is one of the four LHC experiments and the Large Hadron Collider is this uh, big ring uh, underground between Geneva uh, and France. And it's the latest in a long line. There was one outside of Chicago. There's one in Hamburg, there's one uh, out at Stanford, this is actually a linear accelerator instead of a ring. Here's one underneath a football field at Cornell. Um, and just basically, you know, in the past, say, 50 years or so, there's just been this exponential growth of uh, center of mass energy, so how hard we smash them together. And each one brings uh, new information about uh, fundamental particles. And uh, yeah, so it's been growing exponentially, you know, in this graph, but you know, the, the history goes back further. There were, um, here's some photos of some that were in black and white. So it gives you an idea how old they are. Um, and the very first one is actually could fit in the palm of your hand. It's this little um, uh, cyclotron built in 1930. Okay, so step two, take pictures of the carnage. Uh, my experiment takes one megabyte pictures per collision event and we collected about, about 100 billion events so far. So that's about 100 petabytes of data, raw data. Uh, previous experiments, such as the one at Fermilab, uh, collected a little bit smaller data and a lot smaller events. And then if you go back even further in time, this is an event display from, from you know, the early 80s uh, where they only collected 10 million events. So basically there's been a similar exponential growth in the number of rows collected or particle you know, collision events. Um, and you know, if you go all the way back to these, uh, these first bubble changers at chambers, it was literally a photo. You took a photo of the particle trajectories as they went through a, a special bubble chamber and then you sort of hand analyzed them and figured out the trajectories of the outgoing particles and, and what kind of particles and their kinematics. And it's kind of amazing actually that the 6 million such photos were hand analyzed. So big data used to be, I think a lot harder than it is now. Um, once you take these photos, you, you sort of create summary statistics and categorize the different you know, topologies of events and you count them with histograms and, and you can compare it to predictions. So, you know, these funny diagrams correspond to actual math that predict the rates of different types of events. And then you look for, you know, basically uh, rate excesses above what you knew at the time. And if you're lucky, you find something like, you know, the Higgs boson here, uh, the top quark here, or the Z boson, um, you know, way back in the 80s. And this is actually, you know, one of the, you know, 
10 million event plots that turned into only maybe like a handful. So you can see there's a lot of filtering going on and presumably there's a lot of work to, to you know, compact this raw data into something that actually can be put in a plot. And indeed it is, right? So we have, you know, a one megabyte event raw data. We have hundred billion events. That's hundred petabytes. We can't analyze that in a day. We also have all the simulations that correspond to that. And we do like detailed uh, simulations, both of, the, uh, both of the collision itself and then the detector simulation as the alkaline particles traverse our uh, detector material and how they interact with matter and how we actually detect what happened. And we combine those into this reconstruction step and then write that out. And so now we have this experiment managed data that's maybe you know, one to hundred kilobytes per event, depending on you know, what information you're saving and you're still saving all the data. This is all something that's centrally planned and executed by the experiment and you know, has been developed with custom software over you know, a few decades now and you know, is executed over a big grid. Uh, but after you get through all that, you still actually have to do some physics with this, you know, this reconstructed data, these, you know, analyzed pictures. And so that's when you get to this end user analyst stage where, you know, it's actually individual people, individual groups of people from many different universities looking at this data, looking at their piece of the data, trying to understand what happened, what, you know, what kind of topologies they're interested in. And so they have to do things like recalibrations, maybe run some deep neural network inference, you know, things that are more on the scale of one second per event, and they probably don't have to do it for all events. They can probably do some, you know, early filtering to, to reduce the amount of time they have to spend. And then, you know, you end up with this, you know, maybe user managed intermediate data with, you know, some like 0.1 to 10 kilobytes per event and maybe, you know, a tenth as much data. So now you're, you know, if you, if you multiply that together, you're in the kind of terabyte range now. So terabytes is something I think people in this conference are a bit more familiar with. And that's where we start to see um, you know, the opportunity, right, uh, to so issue our sort of custom, you know, uh, boilerplate for something a little bit more modern. But of course, you know, sometimes people might need to do some checks of the earlier reconstruction. Maybe, uh, you know, we, when we first turned this on, we didn't actually know 100% how it was going to work. You know, you have to tune your algorithms, right? You have to, you know, do some data quality uh, checks. And so as time progresses, right, you, you sort of move that, those early checks and those early uh, calibrations into the centrally main software. And I, I like this term that comes from uh, you know, software community, lithification, right? You, you have this like mess of different approaches and you kind of settle on one and you bake it into the software and leaving, you know, less work for the end user. And so now, you know, after you know, almost a decade of running, we start to have these experiment managed data that's already, you know, pretty much ready to go for analysis, which makes it even nicer to start looking at these other tools. Um, and so, yeah, I'll focus basically on this, this last part. Uh, one thing that's happened quite recently is, you know, we've gone from this paradigm of in, treating each indiv event individually, you know, in some sort of you know, mostly C++, but sometimes Python uh, event loop code where you would do your different processing and, and then fill some histograms. Um, but of course, for everyone in this audience, you're much more familiar with the columnar approach where you'll, you know, iter you'll operate on arrays of many different uh, quantities at once because, you know, you get some vectorization improvements, right? And especially if you're working in an interpreted language like Python, you really need this to get the, the performance that, that makes things, you know, reasonable to, to uh, analyze in, in user time. And of course it doesn't work all the time, right? As you get towards the left half of that um, ETL pipeline, event loops are more appropriate because you have more you know, complex algorithms operating on very large per event input. You, know, you can even have intra event vectorization. You know, we have 70,000 crystals in our detector, each of them you need to reconstruct a pulse. That's, that's paralyzable in of, in of itself, you don't need to vectorize across events. And then you have analysis objects. Eventually you start filtering them and projecting, making different uh, uh, you know, uh, composite variables. And finally, you're, you're operating on histograms, which are just NumPy arrays at that point. So it's very trivial and it's almost obvious that you wanna do something columnar there. The other sort of paradigm shift we're seeing is we're moving from these experiment specific and end user frameworks based on top of a monolithic uh, code base that was developed over uh, 30 years called Root uh, into this sort of 
software ecosystem where there's an onion of different components, each is targeted on a specific, you know, application, a specific piece of the puzzle. Um, and we're trying to see how we can use these existing pieces and where we need to add our own pieces to make it work. So to give you kind of a concrete example, I've put together this, uh, this C code that sort of represents as best I could in a nutshell, some of the problems we ran into as we migrated into this ecosystem. Um, and I'll step through it, so don't worry about reading it right away. Um, so at the top, we are, I'm defining the data structures. Um, you know, we have this thing called missing transverse energy. It's effectively just a two vector with uh, uh, polar coordinates. Electron is a four momentum vector, uh, so it's four components and a charge. And the event is just a record that contains, you know, this missing energy value and some number of electrons, various number, depending on, you know, each collision may produce different number of outgoing electrons. Um, then we have some function externally provided that loads this event from some data source, some, some file. And in our field, the data is pretty much exclusively loaded from T-trees, which are these data containers that were developed in the root ecosystem. The kind of interesting thing about them is they actually can store arbitrarily complex C++ types per event in a record-oriented manner uh, because they have this uh, C++ reflection mechanism. Actually, you, root has a C++ interpreter. <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Um, but you can only store scalars in 1D arrays per event in this column-oriented layout. So it's, there's a bit of an impedance mismatch between this, this file type and, and the more modern tools in the more modern data formats like Parquet. And so you can see in this diagram kind of how the, the T tree lives in this sort of middle ground between very record-oriented things like HDF versus very columnar things like Parquet. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, we developed a tool uh, called Upgrid that basically provides a pure Python implementation of this deserialization. So I can open this, this root file, uh, open the events tree and extract NumPy arrays. So this is you know, real missing energy vector uh, values. This is a, the radial component. We call it PT for reasons I don't want to spend time on. Um, so you know, now we have data access. Okay, histogramming. Well, this seems like a freebie, right? We have NumPy histogram, that should be enough. But it turns out our field really, really likes histograms. We like n-dimensional, categorical, irregular, log bin, sum of weight squared saving, all these different things because histograms are a great way of forming empirical PDFs, uh, you know, with well-understood statistical properties from two, data that is too large to fit in memory. Uh, so we have a package for that. Actually, Boost Histogram is, is a package in the Boost C++ library, and then there's a wrapper called Hist, which lives on top of it. And you can, you know, you see an example here of filling some regular band axis between negative and two and two with some random numbers. And then you can fill it again with some weight, and you, you it stores properly all the, the sum of weight squared, so the statistical information to know, know that. And you can see more at the presentation. Um, and then now we have our event loop and we need to convert this to some sort of columnar, you know, vectorized analysis. We can't use pure Python because we know it will slow us down too much. We want array programming. For scalar arrays, this is mostly clear, right? We, if you just have a NumPy array, you have two NumPy arrays, you want to look at one after, you know, filtering on the other, you just use uh, some, you know, some fancy indexing, right? But what about the electrons, right? Uh, the electrons is an array of arrays. And sure enough, if you try to load that with, with the num, NumPy backend, you're going to get an array of arrays, but these are still objects. So you're not getting this vectorized speed up, right? You're still operating one per array. Um, so we had to tackle that. And that in itself uh, spawned a huge, uh, uh, a huge uh, investment in time. And you end up with this thing called awkward. Um, an awkward array allows you to express uh, these nested arrays, among other things, in a, in a vectorized fashion uh, in memory. And you can hear a lot more about this in the SciPy 2020 presentation, but the sort of elevator pitches, it's JSON-like data with uh, NumPy-like idioms. So you have this natural extension for broadcasting to nested arrays, and you also have record arrays, which makes you know, handling these structured objects a little bit easier. So let's put that together. Uh, we'll build up our events as an awkward array with some, some record structure and some, some jagged structure. And then this whole loop becomes, you know, again, some fancy indexing where you cut on this 
property and then you cut on this property and then you fill the histogram with the, the flattened jagged array. Um, and of course you can put all that boilerplate in the library you end up with this very concise function that, that reproduces what's done on the left, including the boilerplate that I left out because it was externally provided in the previous implementation. And uh, you know, this is nice. Now we have a scientific Python solution to our you know, simple problem. And it's so far it's, it's scaled well to more complex problems and we're, we're having a, a good success in, in getting adoption with this, this method of processing. Um, and this, you know, spawned a baby ecosystem of all these different packages that kind of fit in and we reuse the ones like any ufunk from NumPy or SciPy, you know, special functions, those we get for free. Um, but then we just have to add a few pieces here and there. And uh, the coffee package that Exana mentioned this morning serves sort of as an incubator for rapid prototyping for these. And that's what I've been working on with some other people. And then as we get good abstractions, we try to factor them out or the good abstractions may have been found before and, and they're factored into this sort of scikit-hep uh, meta package. So this is fun and it's nice and you know, uh, we've had a lot of success with it. And I hope that people here may look at this package and, and find success for their data processing needs as well. Um, so, and now let's go into scaling. Um, so, we wanted to provide a user interface for this. And when we first started, we were still thinking about various backends. Um, so the thing we did is we basically encapsulated all the user code in some sort of class and taught users, just, just do your physics in this spot and you know leave the rest for us. So users fill a set of accumulators, whether that's histograms or dictionaries or appendable array is not really a, the best uh, example of a reducible object, right? Because it grows every time you append. So, but people like it. People like to get lists of events so that it can go look at them in the fancy event viewer like you saw before. Um, and then the executor takes care of the rest, you know, splitting the task, uh, aggregating the results. It's basically just one big map reduce that's back agnostic. But you can imagine, you know, if I crossed out these others and just left Dask and came back to this example that I was showing earlier, there really isn't much work to be done, right? We just import task bag, uh, add, and uh, you know, make a sequence of our input files, map the process function, and fold with the add operator, and then we're done. So that's great. Um, so yeah, this is really nice. Our our task is very simple, map reduce. We don't need any optimized gra task graph. We don't need any shuffles. Um, so that's all very nice. But there are some cons, right? Like we're putting all this, uh, all this processing in one single user-defined function, and we just wrap it up and ship it to the executors. So some issues there are gonna be large cloud pickled functions are hard for the scheduler to handle because they're like, you know, these are like multi-megabyte and the scheduler is trying to pass them to all the workers. That's kind of a bottleneck. Uh, one solution to that is to pretend their data and scatter them out and then you know, you know, issue a closure later. Um, there's some issues with that that, that have workarounds. Um, Another common issue is because the user code is all encapsulated and there's no ability for DAS to introspect it, the user may do dumb things. They might make a ton of temporary arrays and run out of memory, or even if they don't run out of memory, they might teach the, you know, the, the underlying C malloc to keep a bunch of memory arenas around and not give them back to the OS. And then the DAS worker thinks, oh, I'm out of memory. I, I can't do any more work. Um, so that's, that's another problem that we ran into pretty quickly, but I think there's some, there's some pass out of it, including things like auto restarting from the nanny. Um, the other, you know, the other obvious con is we aren't teaching Dask anything about what the data is. We it doesn't even know, it just sees file names and, you know, the fold operation. It doesn't know that there's arrays at all. Um, and files may have too many rows for one task. So we have to run a pre-processing step to index the files and you know, make manageable chunks. And you can imagine if the events per chunk is much smaller than events per file, now you have this big overhead from reading the file header over and over again. And we have really wide data. We have um, these sort of uh, distilled uh, information still has many columns, up to a thousand. And each person is only gonna be interested in some small subset, maybe like 10% of it. Um, so what we did to solve this problem of, of the boilerplate basically 
is everything is just in time loaded. So when you see this events object being built, actually no arrays are actually read from the file yet. It just um, assembles the metadata into this record structure and uses the awkward virtual array facility to just in time load them as they, as they need to be processed. But again, this is sort of a, you know, a bit of impedance mismatch with traditional you know, distributed scheduling where you have to teach the scheduler ahead of time what columns you want to access. You have to define your schema up front. Um, so you know, this is another case where we're probably not using the DASC system to its fullest and we need to find a better way to do it. Um, one other challenge is user library code. Uh, you know, if someone comes along and they, they want to put this complex function in their my tools Python module and import it, it, it gets to be a pain point. I mean, there are solutions like Cloud Pickle is soon going to have support for being able to Cloud Pickle modules out of the main. Of course, then you have all the is issues with Python versions and all that. Um, Dask of, has this built in upload file for zip balls, which is very nice because it, if you make your zip ball properly, it will upload it and reload the module in the runtime, which is very slick. But then the users have to know how to make a proper Python package, um, including in particular loading like extra binary resources. Of course, some people are, are lucky to have shared file systems and then all of this doesn't matter. You just load your, just read your files as if they were running in the same working directory that the, the client is in. But that's, that's a luxury that not all facilities have. It, it's, it's a challenge to maintain a distributed shared file system. Um, so, these are the challenges we saw and some, some ways we think we can tackle them include um, changing the user interface to encourage more detailed task graph construction. So then we need, then we get a little vendor lock, right? So I don't, I don't think we should re-implement Destillate. I think it's excellent as it is, but that does mean we need to teach the user to make these delayed objects, assemble the task graph or some, you know, some facet of that and let desk uh, go to town optimizing it. Um, and in fact, you've seen, I think I've seen this now where, you know, Dask is used for task graph construction optimization and other backends might be used for execution like Ray. Um, and I think that's a really interesting avenue because you can think of Dask as one, this is one of the pieces that Dask is really providing to the community is this ability to create and manipulate and optimize task graphs. Um, of course, we can do this by hand now if we're you know, willing to declare the input columns up front. And I have an example of that here in one of the recent tutorials. You know, if you want to go, so that's that's telling the user to do something. You could also try to go underneath the user and try to trace the operations they're doing through their through their user code. And then you need basically an awkward array collection type for Dask. So you get a very fine grained task graph. But on the other hand, you don't have any user code change. Uh, you know, assuming all the features are supported, and I, you can hear more about that on Friday. Um, some other you know feature directions is well. As you heard from Oksana this morning, we have our own uh, our own sort of remote streaming protocol, uh, and FSBEC is a great uh, abstraction for these sorts of protocols. So we should write one for X or D, because then pretty much immediately we could do all the ETL operations that you're all used to, of like loading a directory of root files from S3, manipulating them, and throwing them into a data frame and writing to Parquet. We can't do that because we don't use S3. We use X or D. Once we write FSBEC, our life will be much better. I'd really like to experiment with index joints because that's something we just never had before. Um, you can imagine if two different analysis groups were making different filters, you know, different filtered distilled data sets, and they wanted to compare, you know, some subset of the features from each other. Right now, they really don't have any mechanism to, they have to sort of join up manually by the event ID, you know, things like you know, basically dumping to CSV, some small subset of them and comparing. But, you know, with you know, the ability to convert into a giant out of memory DAS data frame, you could do joins on the whole data set and, and, and that may allow more efficient reduced data sets storage. And last but not least is we need to encourage more HEP user analysis facilities to support these. And that's things as simple as firewalls. So um, in conclusion, uh, Collider Physics produces a lot of data. Uh, the end user analysis data volume is still out of course. So it's still uh, sort of of interest to these distributed uh, distributed systems. Uh, the scientific Python ecosystem can process our data after filling in some missing pieces. And we can scale our work with Dask. And I think there's a lot of avenues for improvement that we're excited to 
uh, start working on it and collaborate with the community on. So that's all I have. Okay, thanks a lot, Nick. Um, so we definitely uh, have some time for questions and there is uh, one in the chat right now. Uh, so Thomas asks, is it possible to wrap awkward arrays in X-array objects? That's an interesting question. I don't think yet there's a there's an interface between awkward and X-ray, but there is some some work in that direction. Uh, some of the X-ray developers are aware of awkward and starting to look into it. Um, and I guess there, what you're looking for is a feature of sort of uh, metadata associated with columns, right? Um, I assume, and that's that's sort of a that's a that's a good uh, motivator for for an X-ray awkward integration. And I think that's that's in the future. Cool. So we have another uh, comment here from Florian for improved memory management. Don't miss tomorrow's talk. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Florian, for uh, uh, plugging a, a talk that will be coming up uh, later in the uh, summit schedule. Um, so we, we still have some more time for a couple more questions. Um, in the meantime, I have a quick question uh, while there's nothing pending in the chat. You mentioned, Nick, that there's um, kind of this shift from you know, upstream to downstream end user analysis, yeah. where you, you bring in Dask uh, kind of in the end user uh, thing, you know, part of the story. Um, the uh, question I have is, do you or anyone in the in the community envision um, you know, tools like Dask moving upstream at all? Or do you think it will always, uh, it, will it always be disconnected uh, from that? That will always require custom, you know, very domain specific things. Uh, compared That's a good to that. question. Um, so I think in principle, there's no technical barrier to having uh, tools like Desk run on all tens of petabytes of information. I think it's more just a matter of uh, developer effort, right? Because we have a lot of you know, legacy algorithms uh, written in, in you know, millions of lines of, of C++ code. Uh, and so you know, the, the expense, you know, developer expense of, of having to port that code to sort of a you know, vectorized, uh, you know, scientific Python is, is probably out of, out of scope. And anyway, I think the, the, the improvements that you would see from that are, are limited up to some level, right? Basically, you know, the further you slide back on this, the less likely you're going to see improvements from vectorizing an event. Um, and since our, our, whole, our, our whole operation is very, um, some people call it uh, pleasingly parallel, others call it embarrassingly parallel. Each event is statistically independent, so you can analyze them in isolation um, upstream. So without the need for these sort of shuffle cross join features, um, there's not a huge motivation for moving it back up the stack. Um, it's just very nice uh, at the end user level because it provides a level inter of interactivity that we can't develop ourselves. We have, you know, you can imagine with this much work to do, we have our own custom workflow management solutions and um, they're not, they just operate on a different time scale. They operate on the hours, hours time scale, whereas desk operates on the millisecond scale in terms of task, you know, life cycle. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, this is different, I think, domains, um, but you can imagine moving this, this slider further to the left as, as we find more reasons to, to go lower level. Right. With task. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah, we have a, another question here in the Q&A uh, from Adam. You showed a 2D plot comparing HDF5, root, NumPy, Parquet, et cetera. Where do awkward arrays belong in that plot? Uh, do they belong in that plot at all? Yeah, so this plot is uh, for, say, you know, on disk serialization, although I guess arrow is in memory. And arrow and awkward are almost an overlapping diagram, I would say. There are a few subtle differences between the arrow in memory layout and awkward in memory layout. Actually, awkward, I believe, is a superset. Um, but yeah, they, they both sort of live in memory and they both, you know, are fully columnar and they're very aligned. Um, you know, in fact, awkward could take advantage of some of the, the arrow extensions like uh, arrow data set or um, Gandiva or Gandiva, I'm not sure how to say it. And I think that'll be interesting, you know, use, use things that read arrow and use the, the predicate pushdown that, that these uh, Gandiva 
library and such provide and then use awkward at the top level for the things that are out of scope for the the community that arrow addresses things like these uh something i haven't shown here but we we do need to do combinatorics so like you know electron you know take n electrons choose three or choose two and, and consider the properties of that that combination and so that's something that's built into awkward that is sort of out of scope for arrow Great. Uh, any more final questions? We have about one more minute until the next talk. So yeah, I'll just remind everyone again that, um, of course, during the conference after the session, there will be some uh, some hangout time in Gathertown. And uh, there's no more questions. Um, thank you again, Nick, for this great talk. And uh, yeah, thank you. Recording.